Islam is the second of the world's largest religions. Almost one billion Muslims live in more than 48 Muslim countries and there are significant Muslim minorities in the nations of Europe and the Americas. Despite these facts and the aftermath of the Iranian Revolution in 1979, the West discovered how little they knew or understood about Islam. Ignorance and stereotypes of Islam and Muslim societies were matched by an astonishingly limited coverage of them in the media. In many ways, the Iranian Revolution shot many Westerners out of their ignorance and complacency. It served to generate an interest in Islam and the Islamic world, including the Islamic legal system, or Sharia. The political system of Islam has at times become identified with some form of system of life. There are those who may say that Islam is a democracy, while others identify it with communism and a form of dictatorship. Thus, in certain Islamic states, the practice of Sharia law on offenders of the justice system and criminals to its fullest extent would be seen as barbaric, inhumane and transgressing the moral and constitutional rights of the person. In South Africa, the constitutional rights of a person, including that of a criminal, is protected by the state. Considering the country's high crime rate, one wonders whether desperate times call for desperate measures. However, these desperate measures are what Sharia has become known for. Gruesome images of beheading, amputation of limbs and public executions. Sharia has been subjected to this misconception and criticism over centuries, despite its divine and prophetic origination. The Holy Quran contains 6,666 verses and 86,430 words. It has been divided into 30 parts and 114 chapters. The early scholars have explored the verses of legal injunctions found in the Quran and have identified approximately 500 verses. Despite the divine revelations of Islamic law and principles, the media continues to draw attention and hype to the implementation of the penal code of certain Islamic states. It is this prejudiced image that has created the misconceptions associated with Sharia. There's a presumption, I think, which is inconsistent with the Quran, and that presumption is that uh, Islam uh, has only one objective insofar as uh, criminals are concerned, and that is to punish them severely. That, that is a, a presumption inconsistent with the ethics of the Quran, because the ethics of the Quran is an ethic of forgiveness. So Sharia law, unfortunately, because of the publicity one gets, one seems to perceive or have a picture that Sharia law is criminal law or uh, law of punishment, of amputations, stoning, etc., which is not the case. The focus on the punishment is an area that is a small part of Sharia, but th even that area has been misrepresented because it is a system of justice which is essentially humane and its overriding factor is kindness and mercy. So there is a misconception about the harshness of the Sharia, which is the only aspect that has been presented to people in the world. Well, the misconceptions are mostly based on ignorance and misinformation about Islam. And of course, the media publish a lot of things which are inaccurate about Muslims and Islam. And of course, that creates a climate for people to sort of accept any kind of uh, thing offered by media as to what uh, the real meaning of Sharia is. The other misconception is that in Muslim countries one would find people with stumps of hands walking the streets all the time or one would find amputations on a daily basis. This is far from the truth. In fact, what I have found in my studies is that from the time of our Holy Prophet, the peace and blessings of God be upon him, 1400 years ago up to approximately four or five years ago, there were no more than seven amputations carried out in Saudi Arabia. What this says is that severe punishment act more as a deterrent than anything else. And that speaks for itself. Is this kind of severe punishment the answer to South Africa's crime situation? Are there elements of Islamic justice that can work as a deterrent to criminal minds and activities in South Africa? To understand Sharia is to understand the four primary sources of Islamic law. The Holy Quran, which is the divine book of Almighty God. The Sunnah, 
or example of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, consensus, and analogical deductions, all which forms the divine system of Islamic law. This particular system rests on a paradigm of four pillars. The first one is that it is on the principle of Tawheed or oneness, oneness of the Creator and oneness of creation. The second is that it is based on Jamal or beauty, which is symmetry, orderliness, consistency. And the third is that creation is an instruction to mankind. In other words, all facets of creation is a classroom for instruction to the intellect of the human being. And fourthly, that this instruction serves a purpose or a guide, which we call hudud. So we have Tawheed, we have Jamal, we have Aya, meaning everything, whether it is the sun or the moon, the night and the day, the clouds and the rain, they are there for instruction. And lastly, they constitute a guide. Now once we have understood the paradigm on four pillars, then we now understand that it has a purpose. And the purpose then itself rests on six universal uh, features. The first four of these six universal features are respect and protection of life, respect for family and community, respect for private ownership and property, self-determination and the right to responsible political freedom. The right is not related to the freedom itself. It is related to these qualities because they are inherent in the dignity of a person. So the fifth pillar is there to contribute to the quality of the life of a human being. And the sixth pillar which underpins this structure is knowledge. There is a duty upon every human being to acquire knowledge. And there's a duty on the parent to educate the child. There's a duty on society to provide the infrastructure for children and for people to acquire knowledge. All of this that I have said constitutes the Sharia. The maqasid of the Sharia or the objectives of the law. You know, why did, why did God, why did Allah send the Quran? Why did he send the Bible? Why did he send the Torah? What is the purpose of law? I said the first purpose of law is to protect people's belief. That there is freedom of belief in Islam. And this is consistent with the way the Prophet ran Medina at the time that he became the leader of Medina. That the Jews and the Christians were protected. Their beliefs were protected. Secondly, Islam protects people's material possessions. How does it do that? It is if somebody infringes upon your property or takes your possessions without you, you know, in a criminal sense, then his hand should be cut off. Islam says that your, your person and your persona are protected. Your per person uh, takes your life, his life should be taken. So th that is then the, the, the objectives of the law. It's for the development and protection of the individual and the society. And the laws of cutting off the hand, the law of uh, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, is basically an extension uh, to realize the objectives of the law in order to protect society. To clear the misconceptions of the penal code of Sharia as being inhumane and extreme, one has to firstly understand the judicial process that leads up to the final stage of sentencing, especially in cases of serious crimes. The, the procedure is no different from the systems that we are familiar with, and it's clearly identified. Uh, the onus is on the state to prove the guilt of the accused beyond reasonable doubt. The principle of punishment in Islam is not the seeking of vengeance. An accused is entitled to the benefits of the slightest doubt in the evidence against him. And the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, commands the judge in the words, to err on the side of clemency is better than to err on the side of punishment. In other words, no stone must be left unturned in giving him a fair trial, an opportunity to be heard in all respects, because the sentence is a severe one, and obviously the application of that sentence 
is only in the last resort. Now, 1400 years ago, uh, the death penalty applied to murder, to um, highway robbery, to treason or apostasy, and to adultery. But you'd be interested to know that 19th century England, the death penalty applied to 227 offenses. So when we look at the span of time, the consistency of uh, the sentences is purely that they are related, they're confined to four only, and that too, on the aspect of, for example, murder, the the element of retribution or the involvement of the victims or those who suffered as a result of the uh, deprivation of the bread owners or breadwinners, they have a say in the sentence. And if they want to forgive, the sentence then is suspended. A death sentence is not passed. On the question of theft, for example, it's only when the person, all measures have been examined carefully. Um, there is a society that is economically developed. Provisions have been made. There was absolutely no reason or justification for that person to steal. Crimes of theft and robbery stems from poverty and the need to survive, especially in societies burdened with unemployment, lack of education, and basic living necessities such as housing, water, and electricity. The lack of these basic living conditions work against the implementation of Sharia law. I think there are many stages of development in a society. And at appropriate times, certain social, judicial measures need to be implemented in society. Sharia ought to be implemented towards the latter stage of development of any community, I believe. One needs to ensure that the prerequisites are in place. Like Khalif Umar, he ensured that every man, woman and child had a stipend, not just in his immediate vicinity, throughout the regions over which he reigned. And that if it wasn't a monthly grant, there was an annual grant in place. Before any penal code could be implemented on that particular community, he ensured that the basic needs were met. So if we look at the penal code, for example, we cannot implement the cutting off of hands because somebody has stolen something. We have to ensure that the basic social needs of that person is met before we ask for people to start cutting off hands of people. So this is important in the Sharia, in the stage of development for a community and the timing in which it is implemented in the community is critical and that the basic needs ought to be met. Technically speaking, what needs to implement Sharia and especially penal code, hypothetically perhaps, in a community that is free of need and want. And Understanding human nature, people would strive to satisfy their needs. Sometimes, unfortunately, not through the best ways possible. That is a reality. One cannot ignore that. And therefore, one needs to work firstly towards a society that is not impoverished, a society that appreciates the dignity of labor, a society that is able to sustain itself, to work towards morality, equality, dignity, social justice, distributive justice. It is only at that stage that I think the penal code of Sharia can become applicable across the board if one achieves those basic stages of development in that community. When the Caliph Omar, who was the second Caliph of Islam, entered Jerusalem, there was fear on the part of the communities that were living there that there would be a, a persecution. But the Charter of Omar stands out as a document that would present to communities worldwide the fairness of Islam, the justice of Islam, the humane system that it presented. And even when the patriarch offered Omar to pray in the church, he preferred to pray outside, saying that one day, if I prayed inside one day, perhaps Muslims may want to claim this church. So the Charter of Omar is the best example and the earliest example of the Sharia in the application of rule between Muslims and non-Muslims, between governments, between communities, and between uh, nation states. It is from the charter of the Khalif Umar that one establishes that the rights of non-Muslims within an Islamic state are protected. 
Religious conflicts, particularly between Muslims and Christians in countries like Nigeria and Sudan, have raised concerns about the implementation of Sharia law. Quite often, it is situations like these where Islamic laws are abused by a minority to the detriment of the rest of the Muslim world. The right to religious freedom, thought and expressions are to be respected and guaranteed in Islamic countries. The right to freedom of religion is a paradigm which underpins the Sharia and that has to be respected and protected. So a person who is a, not of the Islamic faith falls within that category of firstly to be respected for his own beliefs, secondly to be protected for that and to be given the necessary means to continue to practice his faith. So it's wrong for people of one or the other to burn down churches or religious institutions or mosques or synagogues is severely condemned and is an act of criminal conduct. So one can't say that the, the actions that are carrying on in, in many parts of the world, I mean, whether they're in Europe or in India or Pakistan or Nigeria or Sudan, is because of any religious convictions. That's simply because of aberrations or emotions and um, behaviors seem to be aroused by political interests of one group or the other. They, they have no justification at all from, from the point of the Sharia or Islam. It has been stated that the increase in lawlessness and serious crime in South Africa has now manifested itself to such a disturbing degree that the framework and the very existence of society is threatened with collapse. The unique position enjoyed by Muslim countries in controlling crime is evident from a review of the 1994 Interpol International Crime Statistics. Eight of the 15 countries with the lowest crime rates in the world in 1994 were Muslim countries. The criminal justice system of any country which fails to guarantee for its citizens the confidence that they can pursue their daily lives in peace and safety soon loses credibility in the eyes of the citizens. A large percentage of South Africans are of the view that the legal system has not satisfied their need for justice in that those who commit serious offences have not been visited with corresponding sentences. Despite South Africa's new constitution, many frustrated and angry citizens are of the opinion that the death penalty should be reinstated. My personal view is that if the death penalty were to be reimposed in South Africa, it will not substantially reduce the crime rate. And the reason for this is that there have to be certain uh, things in place before the crime rate will decrease. One of them is severe penalties, for example, the death penalty. Uh, one of the criticisms that's leveled against the death penalty and against Islamic uh, law as well, or Islamic punishment, is that the death penalty is irreversible. And if a person is wrongly convicted, uh, there's no way in which one could overcome the problem of imposing the penalty. And secondly, why should uh, the courts stoop to the level of the offender by imposing the death penalty? I speak as a Muslim. And when I speak as a Muslim, I speak from the divine book. And the Quran is very consistent. It says, you know, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when describing or when sanctioning, taking a life for a life, which is part of the Old Testament as well. It says that in death there is life. In taking a life, you're giving life. In other words, in taking a life of one person, you're giving life to the rest of the community. So, yes, I am a proponent of the, of the death penalty. If a person steals and uh, the person has gone to the, the court procedure, Islamic court procedure, and eventually he is found to be, to be guilty, then his hand should be cut off. If he's a murderer and he's not forgiven by the family, then the Quran says it like his life must be taken. The crime-inflicted citizens of South Africa are frustrated with a justice system that seems to favor the criminals. This has resulted in people taking the law into their own hands to mete out instant street justice. People do not have the right to take the law into their own hands. Uh, they might have a justification for it uh, through frustration 
and uh, having a problem with the authorities looking after their interests, they might take the law into their own hands, but certainly the Sharia does not allow for this. Uh, this has in fact resulted in kangaroo courts, in necklacing, in uh, community-based organizations springing up, uh, but certainly the Sharia does not allow a person taking the law into his own hand. The objection raised is whether the Islamic law, which is based on the Holy Quran, is applicable to the present era and circumstances. Despite the success in curbing crime, the question raised is, are Muslims looking upon Islamic law as an orphan who desires to survive through prevalent systems of the period? I think it's to create a society in which people won't be prone to commit crime. This is the first instance. The second instance is that when you do punish, punish when the society is in a good condition and you do punish, then the punish should be of a deterrent nature. I don't think we should create uh, uh, prison hotels where it is easier and better to live inside there than outside in society. So there has to be a deterrent nature but also a system in which people can be embedded their life embedded and their outlook on life embedded that they can be they can fit into society in a better way when western ears hear the word sharia you know they cringe because it takes them back to that state in their development when their state and the religion were fused and they didn't want that so what we look at we're looking at a situation at the moment where post colonization period uh, the muslims are now only coming out of that period and i think there's a movement afoot now to say that really the Sharia with its laws is actually a, a system of law which is relevant to, the con to contemporary society. It challenges and it has answers for contemporary situations. If you look at the murder rate, if you, look at, uh, if you look at the sexual revolution in the world, and if you look at Islam's answers to these, then you find that that is the answers that uh, the world is looking for. Yes, they, they, there is a direction a tendency to go there because it wasn't Sharia law as applied wasn't something fictitious or in the imagination of historians it served for several centuries in the past and uh, produced a civilization that made a great contribution to subsequent civilizations so uh, Muslims throughout the world are conscious of this and uh, they are striving but it is a question of where they are focusing and which particular um, aspect of Sharia law they want to implement. It's wrong for states on the other hand, for states in which they have majority Muslim populations, to focus purely on the criminal side or one or two aspects without necessarily ensuring that their political structures first are in place because I refer to the paradigm of self-determination that is the right to responsible political freedom and where there is a consensus between the ruler and the ruled not for the ruler to rule but that both should jointly rule under obedience of the Almighty's law.